Hello and welcome to the Ouseburn Valley. Over the next 25 minutes, I will take you on a tour through this particularly interesting area within Newcastle, which for years was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution on Tyneside. We will revisit old industrial sites, take a look at the present and get an idea of future plans for the area. To give you an idea of where we are, the Ouseburn Valley is located in the east end of the city and the tour I'll take you on will go along the River Ouseburn, all the way to the River Tyne, along the quayside and back again and on our way we'll be passing some fantastic heritage sites and new exciting developments. So let's start. The Ship Inn on the left dates back to the early 1800s and is the oldest pub in the Ouseburn Valley. The name recalls the importance of river craft to the industrial development within the area. The pub, as it is now, was rebuilt in 1905 and is now part of a number of fantastic traditional and modern pubs in the area. Bridges form some of the most striking features of the area's landscape. In total, there are nine road and rail bridges over the River Ouseburn of varying sizes and importance. The design of the bridges reflects the change in transport demands from the 1740s onwards. The tall red brick bridge is Biker Bridge. The bridge was opened to pedestrians in 1878 and carts and carriages were allowed shortly after. Originally only 30 foot wide, it was widened to 50 feet in 1899 and is now one of the key transport routes to the east end of the city. This quaint little bridge is called Crawford's Bridge and is the oldest of the surviving bridges to cross the Lower Ouseburn, dating back to the early to mid-18th century. It was named after Thomas Crawford, a former pitman and publican whose Lorraine arms once stood at the north end of the bridge. The thin grey bridge ahead of us is the Metro Rail Bridge. It was opened in 1982 to connect Newcastle with the riverside, the coast and the eastern suburbs. Built of precast reinforced concrete segments and secured with epoxy resin, it became the first of its type in the UK. The impressive rail viaduct behind it was opened in 1839 to connect Newcastle with North Shields, primarily for passenger use. Its original cheap timber arches were replaced 30 years later with the present iron arches and in 1904 it carried the UK's first suburban electric railway. This part of the area, which leads to the city stadium at the top of the valley, is an excellent wildlife corridor with one of the most significant collections of butterflies in the northeast. The birch trees you can see everywhere have only recently been planted to make this area more attractive. In addition to the line of Hadrian's Wall running across the valley, the area was one of the main cradles of the Industrial Revolution on Tyneside and has a particularly rich heritage. Since the 17th century, when the valley held the England-wide monopoly of glassworks, a wide range of industries have been based here, including lead, iron and lime works, as well as various mills and potteries. As the area developed as a desirable industrial location close to the River Tyne, it developed into a vibrant community with terraced housing beneath the rail and road bridges and a local school. On your right, you can now see the magnificent Ouseburn Farm. Around 1870, the grounds of the farm were a multi-industrial site that included a flax mill and lead works where lead was made into white powder to make paint. For 26 years until 2002, the Biker City Farm covered the area and offered locals a green haven in the centre of their city and gave children the chance to see animals that were not often seen in the East End. In 2002, the farm had to be demolished because of contamination and was reopened again in 2007 as Ouseburn Farm, an environmental training and education centre. Animals on site include chicken, pigs, sheep, goats, guinea pigs and rabbits. This outstanding environmentally friendly building has won several architectural awards and contains a number of sustainable and renewable technologies including solar water heating, a solar photovoltaic system, rainwater recycling and a green sedum roof. It is open six days a week from 9.30am until 4.30pm and entry is free. On the other side of the wooden bridge is Foundry Lane Studios, 
and tucked behind it, you can catch a glimpse of the very unique Rolls-Royce and Bentley garage if you ever need a car for a special occasion. The earliest reference to Foundry Lane dates back to 1815, when a locomotive was built there for the Lambton Wagon Way. In 1853, Robert Morrison established an iron foundry there, hence Foundry Lane. An engine works, specialising in small marine engines, was also established on the site, but was closed by 1875. Nowadays, Foundry Lane is home to a modern architect's and artist studio. The first building on our right is the Clooney, which used to be a whisky bottling plant. We will come back to this building on our way back, and I'll tell you more about it then. On the right, you can now see the back of Seven Stories, the centre for children's books. The unique and quirky boat just outside belongs to Seven Stories and was designed by children for the grand opening in 2005. The story goes that the boat floats off throughout the night to collect children's dreams and stories and comes back to Seven Stories for the day. The blue steel and glass bottles that are dotted along the walkway form part of the Public Art Commission Waymarkers by Lewis Robinson from 2002. Years ago, but with no physical evidence today, there used to be a lime kiln on the bank side that functioned as an essential part of the local industrial and agricultural scene. However, the fumes were both disagreeable and dangerous, and according to some testimonials from the past, they were a great nuisance to the neighbourhood. The before-mentioned Kibber factory was also based along the river and was a great asset to the area. But it was not always popular, especially with parents, as the factory used to taint the river yellow and children sometimes just couldn't resist jumping in it. On the right, you can see a small building that contains a great number of different stones and curious layers of brickwork. Slightly above, you can see pigeon crees that are still in use today. The small and quirky boats you can see in the water belong to the Motorboat Club and have been a colourful part of the valley for decades. As mentioned before, the Ousburn Valley is home to a variety of wildlife. And if you're lucky, you might even see the rare kingfisher bird flying along the river. In the 50s, the Ousburn area had a very special appeal, especially to children, as Stephen Laws can tell you from first-hand experience. Now, the, the fascinating thing about it and the inspiration about the Ousburn Valley as it was in the 50s and 60s was its dereliction, really. Because, it, um, you know, looking out now, the things that have been done are absolutely fantastic. But back then... You had a, a row of abandoned houses on the other side of the bridge there, just underneath by a bridge, which, which were left um, abandoned for some time before they were demolished, and mm -hmm. uh, factories that were, that were empty down here and demolished, and it, it became like a, a kind of big playground for kids. Right. You know, it was, so it's yeah. as if the adults had got up and left this valley okay. uh, to itself. Yeah. So it became a, a very strange, almost kind of haunted playground. After World War II, a period of depression caused a wave of unemployment and social decline. After all the housing in the area had been demolished, the valley became a backwater for scrapyards and storage. People started leaving the North East for better prospects in different areas in England, and Newcastle was seen as a hopeless, contaminated wasteland. In the late 1970s, the Ousburn Valley was declared the city's first industrial improvement area, and public funding was used for infrastructure improvements. By the 1990s, conversion of larger buildings into small units began to attract micro-businesses, particularly in the arts and crafts, music and multimedia sectors. As a result, the famous Ousburn School, which we will visit later on, was converted into the Quayside Business Development Centre. The Ousburn core area covers about 80 hectares, Currently, there are more than 370 businesses in the area, employing approximately 2,000 people. In total, it's estimated that more than £50 million have been invested in the valley in the past few years for conversions and key infrastructure projects. Imaginative, culture-led regeneration schemes have transformed the Ousburn Valley into a vibrant place to work, live, play and learn. The area is now fast becoming one of the most desirable places in Newcastle thanks to the enthusiasm and commitment of the local community. After crossing underneath Biker Bank, you can see on the right a large green open space, 
This is where a cattle sanatorium used to be. It was built in 1876 to act as a quarantine area for live animals that were brought into the port of Newcastle, mainly from Scandinavia. It could hold more than 630 cattle and 3,000 sheep, which were held there until they were deemed fit to be sent to the market or to the local abattoir. By the late 19th century, the development of refrigerated ships meant that it was no longer necessary to import live animals. The cattle sanatorium closed in 1893, and after standing derelict for a good number of years, its condition became so dangerous that demolition in early 2005 was inevitable. To our left, we can see the remains of old glass kilns. Glassmaking has a rich history in the valley. The large building site ahead on the right is the ground of the former Maynard's Toffee Factory. Listen to Irene Osborne about what it was like to work here during the Second World War. We didn't used to pinch the sweets, but we used to eat all the little bits. I used to go to a dance at the time when I was young, you know, and we used to get bags of sweets on a Friday, broken rock and chipped sweets and whatnot, so I was quite popular because I had a bag of sweets with us. The former sweets factory has recently been transformed into a hub for creative businesses, which will be a major addition to the creative cluster already existing in the area. This development, amongst others, makes the Ousburn Valley a unique investment location and will shape the valley's identity in the third millennium. The red bridge you're looking at is the Glasshouse Bridge. Glassmaking is one of the oldest industries in the area. The first glass furnaces were set up during the reign of Elizabeth I by Huguenot refugees from France. By 1838, there were six glass houses in the area producing 60 tonnes of glass a week, half of the UK's requirement. Newcastle was for some time the national centre for glass manufacture. By the 19th century, the industry dominated the area, marked now only by the name of the Glasshouse Bridge. The large grey construction in front of us under the bridge is the Ousburn Barrage. The River Ousburn was once the lifeblood of the area, with barges and boats transferring goods straight to warehouses and wharves. It often provided power for water wheels and supplied water for various manufacturing processes. The condition of the river deteriorated over the course of the last century and the declining water quality had a significant negative impact on river ecology. The tidal barrage and navigation lock was put in place in 2009 to raise and control the water levels along the river and to improve the value of the Ouseburn again. Tucked underneath and behind the bridge, you can see the Ship Tavern, now called the Tyne. The earliest historic reference about this pub was in 1824, when William Smith was the innkeeper of the ship at Glasshouse. Today, the Tyne is one of a handful of popular real ale pubs within the Ouseburn Valley, and regularly plays host to live bands from all over the country. The Ousburn has a rich selection of traditional and modern pubs, most also serving as venues for excellent traditional and modern live music, theatre and other even more eclectic events. Real ales, good food, a relaxed atmosphere and frequent community celebrations are the hallmarks and highlights of days and nights out in the Ousburn Valley. Look up to the left and you can see the Free Trade Inn, another one of the real ale pubs and undoubtedly the one with the best views in town. After crossing the Quayside walkway and about 500 metres in the distance, you can see Spiller's Mill, which is currently being demolished. Spiller's Tyne Mill was completed in 1938 and was then the tallest flour milling building in the world. To serve it, the deep water berth was improved and the rail network extended along the Quayside, the rail tracks can still be seen inset in the concrete roads, waiting to catch the unwary cyclists. Closer to us, you can see a white building with plenty of boats outside. The building used to be the former home of the Water Sports Association and is now the location of the Ousburn Regeneration Centre. This location had quite a different purpose in the past. A dead house stood on the site of this innocuous looking building back in the 19th century. Working on the river could be dangerous work and accidents would happen on a regular basis, often with fatal consequences. During the 1840s and 50s, on average, one body a week was recovered from both the Newcastle and Gateshead Quaysides. 
The bodies were taken to the dead house, which was next door to the River Police Station. The Stone Cellars, an old public house, was also nearby, and many of the inquests were held there on the bodies removed from the river. Let's turn our back to this gloomy bit of the past and continue walking along the waterfront. At this point, we are on Hadrian's Way, and we are approximately 10 miles away from Tynemouth. The area was once busy with commercial docksides, and the Newcastle side also hosted a regular street market. After the docks had become run down, the area was heavily redeveloped to provide a modern environment for the arts as well as new housing developments. Nowadays, the valley is home to a lot of creative people. This includes theatre companies, potteries, recording and rehearsal studios and a wide range of artists and designers. Straight ahead, you can see the magnificent Newcastle Gateshead Quayside and the famous Baltic Mill, the Sedge Gateshead and some of the many bridges that connect the two cities. The Baltic Centre for Contemporary Arts on the Gateshead side was once a flour mill, built in 1950. The mill was closed in 1981, after only 31 years in operation. After extensive redevelopments, it reopened in 2002 as a major international centre for contemporary art, with an ever-changing calendar of exhibitions and events. One of the Quayside's main features is the pedestrian Gateshead Millennium Bridge, which spans the river between the Baltic and the Newcastle Law Courts. The bridge is sometimes referred to as the Blinking Eye Bridge, or Winking Eye Bridge, due to its shape and its unique tilting method to allow ships and boats to pass underneath it. The shiny silver building next to the Baltic is the Sage Gateshead, a centre for musical education, performance and conferences. It was opened in 2004. The tallest of all seven bridges between Newcastle and Gateshead, the Tyne Bridge, was opened in 1928, and its design was based on the famous Sydney Harbour Bridge. The bridge is a key feature of the annual Great North Run, the world's biggest half marathon, which attracts more than 50,000 runners to the city each year. After leaving the quayside, we are joining Horatio Street. Sailors Bethel, the red brick building coming up on your left, was opened in April 1877. The word Bethel is Hebrew for House of God, and in the 130 years of its existence, this building has served as a non-conformist chapel, a community centre, a Danish seaman's church, a doll factory, and now finally, offices. The memorial statue shows a former local soldier, William Coulson, who devoted much of his life to assisting the weak and defenceless, which included animals as well as humans. A leading figure in the NSPCC and RSPCA, he was a founder of the Newcastle Cat and Dog Shelter. Before we are crossing City Road, take a look to the left. The red brick building, about 100 yards in the distance, now called Lime Square, used to be an electricity substation that has now been converted into luxury offices. The impressive Tyne Tea Shipping Warehouse right in front of you was built between 1900 and 1910 to serve the busy continental shipping wharves nearby. Today, the former warehouse is a luxurious hotel with 42 bedrooms and a fantastic restaurant. A hidden treasure in the area is this plaque in memory of the Craig family, or as they were called during their time, the pluckiest family in the kingdom. The Craig family was famous in the 19th century for rescuing a vast number of people from drowning in the Tyne. James Craig was called the Ooseburn hero and is estimated to have saved more than 20 people from drowning. To the right, in the distance, behind the toffee factory, you can make out the former red brick Ooseburn school with its unique pagoda roof. Built between 1891 and 1893 at the considerable cost of £17,000, the school closed in 1977 and lay empty for years until it was converted into a business development centre. Closer to us, on the site of the large scrap metal business, is where the former famous Mailing Ford A pottery used to be. This purpose-built pottery was built in 1859 with the humble earthenware jam jar as the basis of the pottery's success until 1927. There were 16 different pottery sites in the valley, most operating in the late 19th century. The most important of these was Mailing Pottery, world famous in its time. Established by Huguenot refugees, by 1878 it was able to open the Ford B Pottery, the largest pottery in the country which is still visible on the premises of Holtz Yard, located not too far from here. 
a bit further down, we can soon see the entrance of the Victoria Tunnel. Newcastle was licensed to mine coal since 1239, and there were working pits in Jesmond, Biker and St Lawrence. Coal was transported to the riverside by the Victoria Tunnel, which ran under the Ousburn Valley, and can still be accessed by the Ouse Street entrance today. It was opened in 1842 to carry coal underground from Spittle Tongues Colliery for about two miles to the river. Following closure in 1859, it lay dormant until World War II, when the city engineers converted the tunnel into an air raid shelter. To find out what lies beneath the streets of Newcastle, you can book a guided 30-minute or two-hour tour, as well as school workshops for all key stages. For more information, please visit www.ooseburntrust.org.uk. The first building on the left used to be the home of a coal merchant. The words J.T. Potts Coal Merchant and a clock used to be clearly visible on the front of the building. The Potts family acquired the coal depot in 1898 and was run by the family until the 1920s. Further along on the left, you'll see a number of buildings that are currently being redeveloped. One of them, the former Ooseburn Canvas Works, was a sale manufacturing business and was set up in the early 19th century before later being converted into a flax mill. The Ooseburn Valley is full of surprises when it comes to creative touches. Many years of artistic involvement in the valley has left a legacy of public art of all shapes and sizes. Some of the largest pieces are the iron way markers, which guard the entrances to the valley at various points. We've already seen some of the artworks, the blue bottles along the river walkway and the floating storyboat. There are other hidden gems in the area, such as a door full of names, two piles of dishes and even a wall full of beetles. The Ousburn area also has a lot to offer families and kids. Seven storeys at the Ousburn farm make for a great day out, as do Stepney Bank Stables, which is only a short walk from here where people of all ages can book riding lessons. The Wire Horses are a 2002 public art commission by Daniel Reed. Formerly a site of chemical works and then an abattoir, 51 Lime Street opened as a riding arena in 2002 to complement Stepney Bank Stables. We've now reached Seven Stories, the Centre for Children's Books. This seven-storey brick building operated as a flour mill from 1872 to the late 1930s. Various subsequent occupants have included the Workers' Revolutionary Party, including Vanessa Redgrave. Seven Stories opened in 2005 to showcase a national collection of manuscripts and illustrations of some of the UK's finest authors and illustrators for children. The impressive chimney was built in the late 1840s for the surrounding steam-powered factories. Originally, it was even taller than Biker Bridge, but it was shortened around the time of the Second World War. Next door to Seven Stories is 36 Lime Street, the largest artist studio group in the northeast, representing an eclectic mix of some of the best artists, designers, furniture makers, performers and musicians. The building was designed by John Dobson and was completed in 1848 and began operating as a flax spinning mill. In 1860, the building was converted into a steam-powered flour mill. Years later, it became a Scotch whisky bottling plant called the Clooney, hence the current name. During the late 1980s, where the Ooseburn was a backwater full of scrapyards and derelict buildings and sites, a small number of cultural businesses started to rent property. Soon after, the whole space in the main building was filled with over 40 artists and other cultural businesses, and it has been an artistic hub ever since. On our left is the Village Green. Dwellings, including a crowded tenement, formerly stood on this sloping site for over a century before being demolished in 1935. Recently, it was landscaped as an informal beer garden and is usually the central meeting point for the various festivals that happen in the valley throughout the year, of which the Ooseburn Festival in July and the Open Studios Weekend at the end of November are the annual highlights. We are now back at the farm and we've reached the end of our tour. I hope you've enjoyed our little journey through the Ooseburn Valley. If you'd like more information, please visit the Ooseburn Trust office, which is located behind the Ship Inn, open Monday to Friday from 10am to 5pm, or visit www.ooseburntrust.org.uk at any time. Why not come down to visit one of the many pubs in the area 
and enjoy a proper real ale. Goodbye, and hopefully see you soon.